Folds you back in today. That's a good sign. He's feeling powerful. Power move. What's he drinking? Oh yeah, he's getting fueled up too. Big day for Folzy. We are live, but we're also on tape. I know that rattles Mike every time I do it, eh? When I yell out like that, you don't yeah, like that? A little bit. <laughs> we're also on tape. We are in the bowels of Lee's music. It's episode 18 of Kamloops last week. That's Chris Folds. I'm Marty Hastings. Uh, I saw you uh, backed in today. You backed, backed in. in. Yeah, backed in. Why do you back in? It, it seems like a power move to me. You, you always say it's a power move. What it is is you back in so it's easier to get out, especially in like tight spaces. If you go to the, um, the Summit Shopping Center, the worst designed parking lot in the history of mankind, and uh, if you don't go through a spot, you know, to the next one, and uh, sometimes you can't back out because it's just too tight. So it's just easier. It's also safer. The study have shown that if you back in, it's safer. There's fewer accidents when you leave a parking lot. Is there any truth <clears throat> to, which I think is a fact, that back when Kelly Hall was our publisher, he started backing in. You're the editor. He's the publisher. So you're like, i got to match this. I'm the powerful guy in the company here. No. i got to back in, too. So no. you back in right beside him. I come in, third guy in, no. and there's two backed-in cars. No, no. I, I, I was backing in back in, back in Abbotsford when you were still playing, uh, holding the ball for Sean White in football games. <laughs> I, 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 Kelly Hall, he, he, he backs in because it's a power move for him because he's insecure. But for me, it was just, <laughs> it's all about safety. Your wedding anniversary today? It is, yeah. September 29th, uh, third year. I didn't even know about it until I got a reminder from Google Photos. So, um, Any kind yeah. words for your wife? Oh, she said, thank you for rescuing me from a, from a life of uh, misery, actually. <laughs> We've been together for about nine years, I think. Seven, eight, nine years, something like that. And we got married three years ago. But it's just the official thing. We've been together much longer. Yeah. Good show today. COVID in schools. What are we going to talk about with that? Um, yeah, it's been a real controversy because, uh, you know, the Delta variant is really hitting the, uh, the kids. The kids are the ones who can't be vaccinated medically under 12. And uh, the charts that we have on the front page of the September 29th newspaper, or page 5, shows, shows clearly that the, the, the cases are rising among exact ages that can't get vaccinated. Now, they're not going into the hospital or, or not, there's been no deaths in that age group yet, but there are a lot of cases and they could be spreading elsewhere. Um, the concern with parents is that uh, the school year started and uh, Dr. Barney Henry said they would not be notifying people unless there was like a real, a real need to do so. But the, the, she's backtracked on that because there's, a, there's three or four schools in the Lower Mainland that have closed and they've gone to online learning because there's way too many cases. There's this big debate about what defines a cluster, what defines an outbreak. And there's controversy over all the reporting by the BC, CDC and Ministry of Health, which doesn't make sense. And we could talk a little about that later. We will. And we're going to talk about Catherine Pendrell and Jen Jackson in the title of Hastings. That's my segment. Both mountain bikers, Catherine, of course, a legend, and Jen Jackson, an up-and-comer who just won nationals. So we, uh, I sat down with both of them. And uh, we'll hear from them. Also, National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. Yes, it's on September 30th, and it's the first annual National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. It's a federal statutory holiday. It's not yet a provincial statutory holiday. We'll probably see it become one next year, uh, probably. So tomorrow, any federal employees or federal buildings are closed. A lot of the city uh, departments are going to be closed in, re in respect to the, uh, to the day. And um, private businesses, they choose what they do. But uh, we will also be, uh, through Kamloops this week, we'll be at to Kamloops tomorrow on the 30th, uh, covering the, uh, there's a press conference in the morning to update the discovery and also to talk about what they have planned for that day. And there's a lot going on. Originally, this show, part of the idea was to kind of showcase our newspaper, our website, our reporters. So in lieu of a live guest today, we're introducing a brand new segment called Last Week Clique, where we hear from some of our reporters. So that'll be last on the list today. Before we get to the next segment, show feedback. What are you hearing? I mean, we're in an echo chamber, so people probably don't tell us truthfully what they think all the time. But what are your thoughts on what you're hearing back from, the, from people? Well, I hear from some people who say, hey, uh, I, try, I, catch, I catch some of it. I watch a bit of it. I watch all of it. Um, I, I, like the, uh, I like learning about the, um, the events that I might not, or learning the back behind the scenes, more about what we're writing about like the banter between me and you. I figure it was like like a newspaper, you know, you figure it was an older audience, maybe skewed older. My daughter's 22, and in the summer, she was out in Savannah with some friends hanging on the beach. And for some reason, our show came up, not through her, for her, her friends, right? They're all between 20 and 25. And she mentioned, oh, my dad's one of the guys there. And her friend, 22-year-old guy, went, 
that guy's your dad. Oh, I love that show. I watch it every week. And I thought that was kind of cool because it's a younger crowd that it's on Instagram. They're on TikTok and they're on all these other things. But there are people who, 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 who will catch it or who will forward it to somebody. And uh, the biggest thing I, I get from people is that they like to... Um, they like the banter, they like a little bit of the humor, but they like to know a little bit more about what's going on in the community that sort of augments their cover, you know, reading the paper or listening to the radio, watching TV. Well, I want to get feedback from people who watch this. Um, what I hear is they want shorter interviews, like when we do our interviews outside of this banter, they mm -hmm. want them to be shorter. Mm -hmm. like, but some of those people are from outside Kamloops telling me that, and they don't really give uh, shit about <laughs> about Kamloops news. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a tough line to, to walk. Like we don't want to just banter the whole time. We want to nope. we want to be informative. Yep. So we have to kind of figure out that balance. So if you, Mike, what do you think? I like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bonnie, what? Give us uh, give us some criticism. Uh, you, you guys are awesome. <laughs> oh my goodness! Like this is the echo chamber that we talk about. So you anonymous uh, haters out there can send us some messages and tell us why we suck. Um, we don't want to dumb it down, but I do want to follow up uh, on last week's conversation about the handshake in, in the day because of all the feedback I've gotten on this show, which is probably says a lot about our society. I got a lot of feedback about that, messages. You know, you're an idiot. You don't know what you're doing. You don't do the handshake on the first date. So do you have any follow-up to, to, to the handshake, and did you hear anything about it? Uh, no, no, I, I, uh, I think my, my daughter mentioned it to me. I, I believe she mentioned the handshake. My wife did, and... Uh, and we talked about it, and it's it comes to, like last time we talked about personal preference, and and you have to read the room, you have to read the person. Like I said last time, if yeah. if, if if the lady stands up and starts running at you with their arms open, well then obviously a hug is appropriate. If she comes in like this, you don't want to maybe even a handshake. It's well, there, there's no there's no hard and fast rule. No, I want to clarify where I'm coming from. So obviously you, you read the room, but it's the modern dating world. So here's my thought process behind it. If I match with somebody on Tinder. I immediately want to set up a date. I don't want to text back and forth for three days. So generally, I'm meeting up with a person who I don't know at all. If I have no rapport with this person, and I don't get a feel if they might be a hugger. And uh, I think then it's safe to go in for the first date handshake. Also, I made a mistake, I'll admit it. Uh, la my first date with this other girl, when we were outside, I should have read the room. I was locked in on the handshake. It's yep. outside, she's walking across. Mm -hmm. I don't need to go in for the handshake. But here's my reason for doing the handshake indoors okay usually it's a first date at a coffee shop or a restaurant and i like to get there early and because i'm there early to get a nice spot to talk i'm sitting down when the lady arrives and i think it's disrespectful to just remain seated when she well you, you obviously stand but then exactly then you're in a spot you just stand and nod and wait for her to sit down first so i just extend a little hand you know then you find out is it a clammy hand we're dealing mm -hmm, with yeah. a nice firm handshake yeah. till you get the opportunity yep. Um, so it's not like I automatically go in for the handshake every time. I wanted to clarify. Uh, also, I understand that I probably shouldn't be giving <laughs> dating advice. I'm 37, unmarried, single, no kids. How's that going anyway? That that what evolved from that date? We had a second date, so that says a lot about the handshake. Uh, we just agreed that it wasn't gonna be going further. So. Well, that's that's all right. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, when I first met my wife to be, she we agreed to meet at uh, Starbucks at Chapters. And I was late because I was playing poker the night before and drinking wine. But I got there and about 20 minutes late. And she was sitting there just reading a book. And she kind of looked up and smiled. And I just sort of nodded and sat down. And we just started talking. Yeah. So it, And you know, guys you guys had a big night that night? Like you guys talked no, we, for a long time? We talked though? for four hours straight. You had one coffee spark, each. spark though, right? Well, yeah. It, we just, we just, yeah, it, there was a big spark. <laughs> no, it wasn't, it wasn't one of those like fall. It's your anniversary, man. It wasn't, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we went home. We made love. No, we... Um, <laughs> We, I think we, that was date two. I yeah, don't know. No, we, no, I didn't kiss her until the fifth date. She was, thought I was a Mennonite prude from Abbotsford. <laughs> yeah. But no, I was just being respectful. So we talked for four straight hours, had one coffee, and then, and then we had to go because she had to go pick up her daughter, and we probably would have talked forever. Um, so then, then you kind of know there's something there. Yeah. It wasn't awkward, right? But oh. you never know until you go. Well, this, this lady and I, we talked about it. You know, there wasn't a huge spark, but maybe there would have been spark if we let it go on. I'm, I'm guilty sometimes of just pulling the pin too early when I get a gut feeling. You're very guilty about that because sometimes it takes two or three times until you finally, okay, but maybe I got it there. Sometimes you, you know after one. It all depends. Tara Holmes, uh, who's, who's the dating guru who sets people up, she... She, she, uh, she had a few words for me about the handshake. Well, she she oh, yeah. doesn't respect the handshake. No, she doesn't, no. no. She's old school probably yeah. yeah she she should know so i'm i'm learning yep. i'm yep. learning yep all right that was a long talk about dating to start mm -hmm. the show let's move on to mm -hmm. this commercial actually 
Uh, before we go to the commercial, which is a new commercial, which I haven't even edited yet, so hopefully it doesn't suck, um, it's on juicing. Um, New Leaf Produce Market, their juice is amazing. Have you tried it? I haven't, but I'm, 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 I want to try the, the cherry. I love cherries. It's also apple season. Uh, October 30th in Merritt, they have Apple Fest between 10 to 2. They bring a big commercial juicer out. You can see how it's made. You can meet Hermel's here, who's going to be out there on October 30th, and you can buy some of the juice. So check this commercial out right now. Well, old Hermels and I, we've been through a lot together, haven't we, buddy? And now we go through the changing of the seasons. What's that? He likes my jacket. 40 bucks. Sean John, Value Village. Speaking of top quality, which we were. New Leaf Produce Market Juice. It's the best in the business. And October 30th, where are you going to be? You're going to be in Merrick. They bring the commercial juicer out. They show you how it's made right in front of your eyes. Buy the juice. Check out the apples. It's apple season. Pumpkins, Halloween. And maybe you get to meet the man himself, Hermels. Yeah, so that's in Merritt. There's also, they're hoping to have one at the farmer's market, I think October 16th in Kamloops. I was talking to Herman this morning. He's saying there's some kind of logistical issue with water in the city that they're trying to work through. Uh, so hopefully they have one in Kamloops. We'll keep you updated on that. Mm -hmm. Tell us about this photo. Oh, this photo, I, this was, uh, wow, that's Young Folsey in 1994. You could tell by the greatest Canuck team of all time and the greatest logo in all time. That's after the Canucks defeated the Leafs to go to the Stanley Cup uh, final. I think it was. What does this make you feel about this Well, this, 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 this came to me. I used to work at the Abbotsford News for about 13 years. And last week, they, the, 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 it's an iconic building in Abbotsford, a big, big, huge news building. It, yeah, there was a press hall in the back. It was, it, was, it was really big paper. We had, like, you know, a staff of 12. It was, it was it, just in the newsroom. It was great. Um, there was, like, a couple hundred people in the whole building when I was there. Now there's like 17 in the entire building, but uh, they just closed. They just they just moved from that building. They sold the property. They're moving to a really nice small small office in Camel in Abbotsford. So one of the guys I used to work with is still there. He sent me this photo they found. Mm. So that's just me. <laughs> 1994. So I would be what uh, you know 20 mid 20s. Yeah. And um, I'm on the phone, and that's my desk. That was my work desk, uh, working on probably that big murder story, the Abbotsford killer. I, I put it up. That would be an interesting story. We could talk about that for a while, but we'll talk about. Um, I put it up because he just had a birthday. He mm -hmm. just turned 53. Mm -hmm. Well, how the Lions treat you on your birthday? Lions. Uh, yeah, they, it was a shitty birthday for the Lions, <laughs> man. And Cody Fajardo for the Rough Riders. For those who don't know, he never got into the end zone, so they're really five and two right now. That was a horrible, horrible call. Horrible game. Yeah. Horrible ending. It was. It, it, here's the thing, and it's and it's so stupid. I was telling my son this because he he loves the Cleveland Browns. My son's in Montreal now, going to school, and he and he texted me after a loss last year and said, "I finally know why you were so angry for weeks on end when I was young." <laughs> and it's true. You, and it's stupid because it, it makes no sense. But if if you really love a team for whatever reason, and, and there's a backstory to why I like the Lions, but I won't get into it here. But it goes back to 1977 in Langley Hospital. But I. When they lose a game, and especially when they lose a game they should win, my entire week is shot. It's, it is shot. I'm depressed as hell the next day. I just, I just, I'm in a bad mood. When they win, it's like, I won the lottery. Yeah. And so this Friday, they're playing Winnipeg at home, and um, that'll tell how my week goes. It's really shallow and doesn't make any sense, but, <laughs> but everyone I know who's a huge sports fan understands this. I want to ask you about death. Because um, if you're going to die, it's probably going to be some heart attack because the Lions lost. But you're mm -hmm. 53 now. Mm -hmm. You're getting a little bit older. Mm -hmm. How does it feel to be getting older? If it doesn't feel great, but I don't feel 53. I mean, I feel I played pickleball last night and um, uh, with a 26-year-old and a 57-year-old and, and a 55-year-old. So uh, I still can run after the ball. I can still run up and down the stairs without wheezing. Um, I don't feel 53, but um, it's, it's not great getting old. <laughs> the good thing about getting old is you get wiser. And then when your kids, my kids in the 20s, and they have issues or problems and they come and they're all freaking out, you can say, look, I've been there. It's not that bad. Or, it, it's good to give counsel. I'm already starting to feel like I'm getting older. You, you and I had a conversation, again, one of our raging conversations that would be more entertaining the show about, you know, we're working, working a lot. I mean, like, what's what's the point? Like, you work these 10, 12-hour days, and you see when people die on Twitter. Oh, yeah. It's like, for a day, you know, this was a great, you know, he did a great job at work, and then you're just forgotten. Like, no, your, your work's forgotten. I mean, do you feel, like, do you ever wonder how, you, you know, are you spending your hours in the right way? Yeah, and I think 
and I think the pandemic has crystallized that for a lot of people. There was a report on CBC News, uh, CBC Radio a few days ago. Uh, they were talking to someone about how, you know, people can't find uh, w w a lot of the restaurants and a lot of the more casual jobs. They can't find employees. And it's not just because people are sitting at home living on the CERB. They, they, they looked into it and did a survey. And a lot of people reevaluated their lives and realized what's more important. A lot of them started jobs. A lot of them downsized. A lot of them realized they don't need as much as they think they need. Money, material possessions, all that kind of stuff. It gets a little bit into the hippy-dippy stuff, but yeah. it's true. It's true. It's uh, and so um, yeah. What's it all about? Yeah, you, you gotta you gotta think that we had a call last night, and I was kind of stressed out over something. Uh, the, the dog was bothering me, and <laughs> the lions lost a few days ago, and 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 I had just worked eleven hours, and I and it gets tiring, and it gets really tiring because you're right. You know, you die, and then what happens? You have a few bylines in the newspaper, and they go on to the next guy. And nobody remembers. That. Nobody remembers so, unless you're someone like real famous, like Michael Jackson, and then your legacy gets tarnished <laughs> anyway because they'll probably find out I did something really horrible five years before I died. And then, yeah, you'll be canceled two yeah, days after. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. After that conversation, I'm sure we're probably just going to go back to work and work till <laughs> midnight anyway. But yep. um, let's go on to your segment here, Above the Folds. You already gave us the background. Let's get right into it. COVID in schools, what's going on? Yeah, it's been a flip, not a flip flop, but a back and forth. Uh, there's the provincial health officer, Dr. Bonnie Henry, and there's the health minister, Adrian Dix, um, and who through most of this pandemic have been sort of um, lauded for how they've handled the pandemic um, most of the time. But as the pandemic go, you know, prolongs, the criticism will come up because people are frustrated. But there are certain things being done that people don't agree with them. The one is the, the about face as school started this September, this this month, with respect to how do they deal with COVID exposure notices. Last year, any time a school had a positive case, even one kid who, who tested positive, they would send out uh, to the parents and they would also post on the Interior Health or whatever health region's website uh, an exposure notice. It just means that there is a potential exposure at this school just so you know and you can you can uh, act accordingly. Mm -hmm. So you, they'd say, you know, on, on, on September 17th at Aberdeen Elementary, there was, a, there was an exposure, which means that someone there tested positive. So check your kids, check yourselves. Um, if, if you get the symptoms, get tested, stay home, blah, blah, blah. So this year, Bonnie Henry decided not to do that because she said those notices um, uh, un, you know, unintentionally, unnecessarily uh, sort of st uh, stressed out people too much. Mm -hmm. But a lot of parents, a lot of parents said, no, we want to know these stuff. We want to know whether I should, I should check my kid. And, 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 if, and if my kid is positive, I don't want him going to visiting grandma and, and killing grandma. So there was a lot of pressure and they've, they've done an about face now. And now they're going to start, go back to the original where, they're, where if there's a case in a school, they're going to tell you about it. Yeah, I think you said in an email to me that parents are really livid or some of them are and they're contacting you, but it's kind of the same thing where they don't really want to go on record right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so they, they, they had a press conference on, on September 28th to say that, okay, we're going to go back, we're going to start notifying people, but that hasn't happened yet. And, and there's also the issue of under-reporting. So we get a phone call from a parent of St. Anne's Academy, a private school here in Kamloops. And she called me and she told me that uh, there's uh, at least 16 cases, maybe more. And the school, in her opinion, the school wasn't doing enough to address it. I think the school said, well, we're taking our advice from Interior Health and they take their advice from the provincial medical health officer. Uh, the parent was upset, well, concerned and upset because she said some of the students who tested test, test positive were still going back to school. And aside from one class, all the classes were still going on. And she's, a, she's afraid of the cluster being an outbreak and then getting into the community or getting into the homes. So Sean Brady uh, is looking into that story. Uh, and then it's, and it's hard to get information because Interior Health will say, well, there's a handful of cases. We don't know exactly how many. And then um, if you go to the website of, uh, of uh, the BC Center for Disease Control, some of the schools are listed there, some aren't. Um, it's very haphazard, but um, there, there's a group in, 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 in the, the Lower Mainland, I think they're in your neck of the woods, South Surrey, White Rock. White Rock. And it's two, two mothers, two mums, and they've started, a, last year I start, they started it, and, and, it's really, and it's a really good website. It's called um, BC School COVID Tracker. And it's, it's, it's all verified, it's not just rumors. Mm. So they verify, they ask people, if you have a kid at a school, and the kid is tested positive, we want to know, we want to create a database for everybody to look at, because the, the government's not doing it the way a lot of people want them to do it. And it's a pretty good website. I looked at it this morning, and um, 
they have to verify it through letters. The, the per, you know, you have to show here's a letter I got from my my my, my kid's school, or it has to be ver verified through. Uh, a doctor's diagnosis or from the BCCDC website. And through that, just today, I found out Juniper Ridge, Aberdeen Elementary, and uh, St. Anne's, and another school in town have all had exposures. We didn't even know about these exposures. Yeah. And the, the argument is, well, do we need to know? Does the general public need to know? Maybe not, but maybe the parents there who don't know should know. So how do we approach the coverage then? Is it Michael or Jessica, and how are we going to look at it if we can't get people on record? Uh, well, no, we, we did the story in the, in the newspaper today. This parents, week's newspaper. I mean, though, you know, like p upset parents, or I guess what's next for our coverage on it? Well, you, we, 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 we've, we quoted the, the, the parent. We, we, we withheld her name because it wasn't essential for the story, but we have to know who she is so we know who she is so it's verifiable. And, and, and it was verified through, through the interior health. What's next for the story is, is uh, we're going to find out when and how they implement these new exposure notices and, um, and whether or not um, we can get a, a clear answer as to what's a cluster and what's an outbreak and based on that, what the actions are because it's very confusing for a lot of people. Anything else in that vein? Uh, just the, um, the, uh, the, the, the provincial government came out with a, uh, last week with an explanation about how they count cases in, uh, in hospitals. And, and Vaughn Palmer from the Vancouver Sun has a really good column, you should read it online, about, about this. And I, and I had the same problem is, is you, you look at the numbers, you think, well, okay, there's 300 people in the hospital and 150 in ICU, and there you go. And then I did a story last week, last two weeks, I did a story where I said uh, almost all the people in hospital for COVID in, in interior health, almost all of them are in ICU, which is pretty amazing. There was 55 people in the hospital and 52 are in ICU, which means they're all very, very critical care, and which is unusual. It's usually a much bigger gap. And when I wrote that story and posted it, I get a call from an infectious disease doctor I know who I go to for information all the time. Mm -hmm. And she said that those numbers don't seem wonky. There's more people in the hospital not in critical care with COVID. I know this. And we we're trying to figure out why there was a discrepancy between real life numbers that they know and the numbers on the database. And, and, and this is being heard elsewhere too. And there was, a, I think, a CTV reporter who kept hammering the government on that. And they finally released the information last week. And it turns out that if you go to the hospital with COVID and once you, you're in the hospital and once the COVID runs through your system after two weeks, you're no longer infectious, but, you, but you're still sick, you know, the long haulers, they move you to, you know, the regular ward and they don't count you as a COVID patient anymore. Mm. So it, Von Palmer is saying it's making the government numbers look good. See, we're doing a good job, the numbers are low. But that person in there is still a COVID patient because if they didn't have COVID, they still wouldn't be in there. But, the gut, but they had some explanation yesterday, it was all gobbledygook. Um, but, but the point is they should be saying that the people who are no longer infectious, if you're still in the hospital, you're there because of COVID and you're still a COVID patient. And it would benefit the government to admit that because then, you're going to have, you're going to say, see, this is why you need to get vaccinated. This is why we need people to get vaccinated because the hospitals are clogged up. The whole point of this is not really that we're going to die from COVID because most of us won't. The vast majority of us won't even go to the hospital with COVID. The big, big worry is that if a, too many people go to the hospital, we're seeing in Alberta now, it's going to overwhelm the health system and the guy with cancer and the guy with a heart attack can't get in and they die. So it behooves the government to just say, yeah, these people are in the hospital and, and we have these numbers of COVID patients. And the, th and the third thing is, by taking them off the COVID list, maybe to make the numbers look good, and then to be caught out doing it, only, only further emboldens the wacky anti-vaxxers. And they're going to say, aha, see, they're lying to us about this. What else are they lying to us about? The virus doesn't exist. So it's just a big, it's a big mess. And it's, all, it's, a, it's about data, and, it's, and they try to explain about how they collect data, but it's so inside baseball, I, I didn't understand it. Von Palmer didn't understand it, and he's a, he's a smart guy. Okay, we'll leave it there, except for my old roommate was named Palmer Vaughn. Did you know that? No. Yeah, <laughs> Palmer Vaughn. Really? <laughs> yeah. Was he story. a reporter? It turned out to be a reporter. No, he was a rock climber, kind of outdoorsy guy, real nice guy. He's now moved to Kelowna. But, what, uh, what's he doing in Kelowna now? He's, he's dating... Uh, uh, Darcy Pinio's sister, and she's out there working. They move there to work, kind of thing. This is a terrible aside. Mm -hmm. People don't want to hear this. Palmer Vaughn. Palmer Vaughn. It's a great name. <laughs> Imagine if they got together, the world would explode. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's move to my segment, the Tattle of Hastings. This is a fantastic photo, and I'm going to flash up the photo credit. So this is Jen Jackson here. Uh, on the right, and Catherine Penderel on the left. Legend, uh, four-time Olympian. I won't get into her resume because I, I talk about it uh, in the clip. 
This, she's from Barrie, Ontario. She's 26 years old and was looking for a change, was kind of stagnant at the start of 2020 before, before the restrictions kicked in, obviously, and you couldn't travel, I guess, because she moved out yeah. and moved in to Catherine Pendle's basement. She called her up. She said, look, my career, I'm just not feeling too great. I need, to, I need a change here. And needs Catherine a mentor. Needs, needs a mentor. Mm -hmm. Catherine accepts her in to the basement, becomes this mentor to her. And Jen Jackson, last weekend at Nationals in Quebec, wins the national championship. Catherine Pendrel placed fourth. And I uh, had a great conversation with Jen about Catherine and about her big victory at Nationals. I can kind of look at the photos and get an idea that it meant a lot to you to win that race. But take me back to the finish line as you were crossing it. What was going through your mind? Well, once I got I, my trip down, like the last descent to the finish, I was an absolute mess. Like I, in your mind, they tell you just, you know, don't think about the end of the race, just focus on the riding. But I just couldn't not think about getting to the finish and winning. So I actually had the shakes. So I lost a ton of time on the last descent. But as I was coming to the line, like I wasn't even excited or I couldn't bring myself to celebrate because I was just too overwhelmed with just feeling like I was actually living a dream it was like this is something I thought about for so long that to like realize in that moment that oh my gosh like this is actually real I was like just too overwhelmed with emotion I was just crying <laughs> I couldn't actually celebrate so I got to the finish and Keith my coach was there it was like big hug and then my team manager was there big hug and then I'm like where are my parents? But I knew they'd been up at the top of the course. So they were still like just moments later, they're like running down the hill to the stadium and my mom's coming and they came and came right out. So those are some of the best hugs I've ever had. What's your relationship like with Catherine? Like one of my best friends and like in a, but in like a very, almost like a looking out for me way, like as a mentor as well. Um, definitely she and Keith, they're like my family away from home. Kind of, I wouldn't say that they're not my parents, but um, they definitely have kind of taken me under their wing. And yeah, being, well, I mean, honestly, being able to see how she was able to go from giving birth to then like two months later being like, um, like a, in the 20s at a World Cup was pretty insane. Like the rate at which she improved and kind of came off of what it just like for times it seemed like me and like this is going to be impossible for her to come back and be at a world cup level but she was just super determined and methodical with it and again just like being very conscious of the process that she was going through it makes you just realize how much just your belief and then just the patience to get through things is really valuable super athletic She's really smart. I could, had a 20 minute conversation with her and she dropped that she's getting a second degree in there. It wasn't, she yes. wasn't trying to brag. Yeah. Um, and she's also got this kind of like joie de vivre and she works at Spoken Motion. She's probably one of these people that everybody knows and buys coffee for. She's, she's just got it, got it and all she's going. She's very ebullient. She's very, very um, effervescent and, yeah. uh, in the interview and she's so excited and she's got great teeth. And, she, and she's a great addition to, mm -hmm. to Camelops. Hopefully mm -hmm. she sticks around. Catherine Pendrell, this Nationals was her last. So no more World Cups, no more Olympics, no more World Championships. And what an ambassador she's been for, for the sport. She's not done yet. She might still race a little bit. She's going to stay in the industry, it sounds like. Uh, I wanted to talk to her. She had a baby in January. Yeah, she comes right. back from having a baby in January. And then her last event of the year, World Cup, she finished 15th, which was pretty much her best result yeah. of the year. So she could keep going. She turns 41 tomorrow. I think. Uh, anyway, just wanted to reflect with her on her career, and we did that in this interview. There has been some just wondering of like, oh, should I really step away? But then also some, yeah, you know, it is time. You know, my whole family's been on the road all season with me this year, um, just because of the year it was and having a baby. And um, so kind of looking forward to getting home and just being able to settle into home life. I think you were 15th in your last World Cup. That was your yeah. best result of the season. You, yeah. uh, was there any part of you that's like, man, I worked so hard. I gave birth and look at my results got better at the end of the season. Like maybe I could just go another year here. Yeah. I mean, you do have that. And, and cause I, um, you know, finishing the season being Canada, still Canada's top points earner. And um, so there is 
a bit of that, but then at the same time, sorry, my, my mama's canaries and they're getting loud. <laughs> I couldn't hear them. Um, <laughs> Um, oh, there they are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but there is that, but I think there's, that's the thing with what we do is like, there's always one more race. There's always what you could do. Um, at some point you just have to make a decision and the idea of being on the other side and being able to support other people to get where I am, that's, that's what excites me now after your last world cup or after your last world championship, or even more recently after the national championship, where you had those kind of emotional outpourings, realizing that that part of your career is over. Um, yeah, I mean, I hadn't really until nationals. And then right, right before we go into the start box for a race, my mom's like, Oh, look at the tribute they did to me, to you. And I went over and they had made this big collage. And then I just started like opening up tears. I'm like, Oh, okay. I didn't realize I was that emotional just the the strength of the relationships and and the experiences that I've had on the circuit right so let's deal with the resume so far and we can't read it all because we'd be here for a long time but we'll pick <laughs> we'll pick some of the highlights Olympic bronze medalist four-time Olympian two-time world champ three-time world cup series champ eight national titles I think six cross country and two cyclocross yep yeah. good Commonwealth Games gold medalist Pan Am Games gold and silver we'll stop there um you hear all that what do you think that sounds pretty good <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know that that is why it's easy to step away because I have achieved a lot and in all honesty I know that to to achieve at that level it takes a hundred percent focus a hundred percent commitment and I can I can feel I, I think the best description somebody gave me is that deeper into your career is like you've had these racehorse blinders on and then they keep getting wider and wider and wider as you kind of near the end of your career and I, I feel that and it's, it's harder to go all in with the same passion that I had at the beginning and it, that's what it takes to be the best and so um, that's why it feels easy to step away. I want to ask you about your outlook in life and how it's changed since your big new edition in January. Um, yeah, having a baby has been a huge, a huge change in, in lifestyle, but it's, it's definitely come at a really nice time, um, where I've, I'm very happy with my career and, and ready to take that next step, but also get to leave the sport on my own terms. I'm, I'm not, I did come back after having a baby and get to see what that's like and, and, uh, to go through that experience um, and get to share it with her. And I think there's gonna be so many neat pictures and memories that we get to share with her when she's older. In, in high performance sport, often your training has to come first. And that's definitely hard when you have a baby. Training does come second, um, but um, figuring out that you can balance that and, and just how to balance it and how to, to, to yeah, to find your best performance and also be a good parent. How, how cool is it to see the reactions from a lot of mothers out there? I know even in Kamloops, the comments on the stories that when we would talk and you would have these quotes about how it's possible to do both. Absolutely. It was really, it is, it is really cool to see um, just how supportive people are and how many women are looking to, to see that that is possible. Um, also that it, it's really it's really hard and and you know unless you have the the right support it's um you know and like the, all the many variables that happen when you have have a child um but yeah just how many women were looking for that re inspiration both women that are moms and already and and dads i've heard from a lot of dads as well as women my competitors that they're doing this and they're wondering if a family can be a part of their lifestyle if they have to retire, if they want a family um, and just seeing one model, uh, one example of how it can be successful. She arrived in Kamloops 2006. She's going to stick around. Catherine, her husband, Keith, is her coach. She's a teacher in town, I think at Valley View. Uh, and uh, hopefully they stick around for a while. Any biking stories um, growing up? No, the only the only biking story I have is uh, it's my earliest memory. It's my earliest ever, ever memory. I was five years old, I think four or five, and I was riding my bike in Bevan Gardens in Abbotsford. It was a hot, hot August summer day, and I'm biking, and I fall over and I skin my knee. 
and I'm crying and screaming and crying. And then uh, Mr. Hardman came out of the corner. Um, <laughs> they're a Danish family in the in, in the in the townhouse complex, and he comes over, and my mom and dad were nowhere to be found. And um, and he looks and he brings me up to his step and he puts some of that uh, ointment on it, and then he wipes away my tears and then. Uh, I sent me on my way. That's my great biking story. Actually, you just sparked, and I hadn't prepared this one, but uh, I have a very bad early um, biking memory. <laughs> we were in Lillooet visiting our doctor friend who's now passed away, and uh, I had this brand new bike. I must have been, I don't know, under 10, and I wanted to show off, so I, I get out of the driveway, and I'm just you know, showing everybody how fast I can go head down, just right into the back of a truck, <laughs> and just started crying. That's trauma. I hadn't thought about that in a long time. And the truck probably got damaged, too. <laughs> yeah. um, interesting thing here is, is watching the interviews is that um, uh, she's now moved out of the, of the basement because mm -hmm. uh, the baby's there and everything, and she wants to go on her own. But it's like two Kamloopsians, top five at the national championships. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, like that's if you think about it, what's the, the the ratio of it's pretty damn good. Well, and it's sad to think that from my media perspective that we won't have. You know, I didn't have a clue about mountain biking for the first five years of my job, and I'm sure she might argue that I still don't. Yeah. Um, but I've tried hard to learn and, and understand how their sport works, and it's going to really suck not having Catherine. You know, every Olympics, a new well, Olympian to cover, a World Cup yeah. ch series champion. Or so it kinda, well, it's passing the torch to the to the new generation, so we'll have. Agenda there, and um, yeah, it's, it's, like you say, learning about it. There's, 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 uh, there's the World Cups. There's the national championships. The cy cycle cross. The cycle cross is another one. So she has the nationals coming up in cycle yeah. cross as well. She could be uh, in the same year national champion. Yeah, twice. so different segments in it. But and that's what I was saying before. Again, like I don't want to belabor this point, but uh, at the start we talked about what do you like about the show, and then when we have a good guest on and we talk to him, I always like learning something. Mm -hmm. It's and all I, about learning, curiosity, and so you've learned a lot about this sport. And some people, it. yeah, some people want to learn with the shorter clips, so I've, I've cut them down for this show. Mm -hmm. I did post the complete interviews of both, yep. and I, I would encourage you to watch them. I thought they are pretty good. They are. Catherine talks about how she thinks about the media. Mm -hmm. Did she like dealing with, with the media, mm -hmm. uh, motherhood, and how, how she's inspired other people by doing what, what she did? Uh, what's next for her? Does she regret leaving? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we talked all her resume, which is insane. So check yep. it out. Cam Loops last week uh, on YouTube. Subscribe. We're almost at 100 subscribers. So. That's pretty good. We were at zero 18 weeks ago. Yeah, we were, I don't know if that's a good ratio, but we'll take it. Let's move on to last week, this week. I hastily made this logo. So Lee Malbuff, a production manager at KTW, we need you to make a good logo because this one, this one's not titled. What do you think? Is it a looks like average? bad beef? Looks like bad beef to me. We yeah. need Lee Malbuff to uh, to fix it up. No, it's great. It's better than I can do. So if it's better than I can do, then it's great. I don't know about that, but uh, okay. New segment. Last week, click. We want to introduce people to our reporters uh, through video and give a sense of what they're up to in the week or if there's a story that they really thought was cool that they're, that they're interested in and yeah. want to And you can meet them and hear them and see what, what, what the faces and the voices are behind the bylines. Right. So why don't we just start with an introduction of each of the people we'll see. Jessica Wallace, why don't you start there? Jessica Wallace, is uh, she covers uh, City Hall, politics, a uh, bunch of stuff for us. Uh, she's very uh, tenacious, very aggressive. Uh, her claim to fame so far is the TNRD story, which was a pretty amazing story that has resulted in uh, uh, monumental changes at the TNRD, uh, and she covers City Hall uh, really closely. Um, she was working last night. She's working all day yesterday at City Hall, and uh, she's going to tell us what, she, what, what she's uh, what she's working on. Yeah, she's fantastic. So is Sean Brady. He shines his light everywhere he goes. Mm -hmm. So let's let's talk about his nickname first. He he was probably one of your best hires. I'll say you've had some questionable hires, but he's he's <laughs> he's, he's, he's he's good hire. He. Um, Sean Brady, he's a, he's, he's, a, he's a good guy, he's a quiet guy, but he, and he's a very technologically advanced. He's mm -hmm. the guy who knows a lot about the, the inner workings of uh, you know, graphics. and uh, During the fires, he was huge. Yeah, yeah. getting databases, stuff like that, yeah. But he replaced or came after Adam Williams, mm -hmm. and Adam Williams was called Andy. For some reason, at the Camelot's Daily News, they called him Andy. Because, uh, you know, the, the, the great singer from Days Gone By, and it was a joke. And people actually probably, uh, you know, mistakenly said Andy Williams, because Andy Williams, for those of a certain, you know, vintage, it was a very famous singer. So Andy, Adam became Andy Williams, and he hated it, by the way. <laughs> he did. He didn't and, like uh, it. And uh, the more he hated it, the more people would call him Andy Williams. Exactly. And Sean sat in 
Andy's old seat. Yes. So we started calling him Shandy. Shandy, yeah. Which turned into the, the Shand chandelier. Chandelier, yeah. And because he shines his light on all these stories. <laughs> so we call the chandelier, Shandy, we're going to hear from Sean Brady. Yeah. And finally, Michael Potestio. Uh, go Testio. Uh, Michael Potestio, he's a... Uh, uh, and all, interesting, all three of them are true grads, true journalism grads. So shout out to uh, the Thompson Rivers University journalism program, as as are you. So that's mm -hmm. four right here. Uh, Michael Potestio is um, he covers uh, uh, well. He, he's he's our local journalism initiative reporter. So Michael Potestio is 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 a reporter here, but he is being funded through uh, the News Media Canada federal government. Um, Local journalism initiative, which 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 funds journalists in um, in areas that they consider news deserts, and uh, it's it's basically it's a fancy word of saying we need coverage here in these areas, we can't afford everything, and so the uh, so the government and the news media can chipped in, and he covers um, uh, is it the homelessness issue, the um, the uh, opioid crisis, indigenous related issues, uh, for our paper and. Um, and he chips in wherever he can elsewhere, taking photos, um, writing up press releases. He's a, he's a good worker. Let's have a look. Well, if you're a fan of having drinks downtown on the extended patios, good news for you. If you were expecting to skate in Riverside Park anytime soon, bad news for you. Today with City Council, um, they met here because this is where they're meeting during the COVID-19 pandemic at Sam Inn Center in the boardroom there. And um, Council voted today to um, not proceed with building a skating rink, at least in the immediate future. They did approve the rehabilitation um, of the spray park, however, at a bit of a lower cost, as well as building a new um, washroom and change room facility. They did also leave the door open to build a skating rink outside in the park at a future date, but um, stay tuned to see whether that will come to fruition. There will be some kind of material put down in the concrete of the spray park. Um, but the concern was around the cost and um, it sounds like there are some worries about a, a significant tax increase potentially this year. So council was um, aware of the economic impacts it might have on residents. So the other thing that's going on is um, it's been a really busy week actually for city council because they have committee meetings um, earlier in the week. And one thing of note that I'll mention is they were provided with some statistics about how much water was used during the heat dome that happened, historic heat wave where Kamloops was scorched you would know it from these uh, nice plants here. 40 degree temperatures and Kamloops used the most water in one single day it has used in 10 years, June 30th this year. So the city's actually looking at implementing a phased in kind of drought friendly water restriction in time for next year's growing season that would see people have to reduce their water usage when drought conditions were occurring. So, oh, there's a city staffer, we're hard at work. Um, that will be coming next year, so stay tuned for that. And then um, tonight there's a public hearing. There'll be some more stories coming from that in the next day or so. Stay tuned and um, on a bit of a coffee bus. <laughs> <laughs> just filed before deadline. I just want to say thanks for supporting us and um, hope to keep doing this in the future. <laughs> this week's paper, you'll find a story from me about uh, the housing crunch up at TRU, uh, which has been kind of complicated by the city's rejection of their proposal, which was to build uh, work camp style housing, about 150 units, or 150 beds rather, uh, in a parking lot up at the university. The city rejected that request, but uh, this week we'll be finding out more about their plans to remedy the crisis up there. Uh, plus a story about COVID-19 cases over at St. Anne's Academy. Uh, Interior Health won't say how many cases there have been so far and the school's been silent. Um, but this, as the province announces, you know, a return to the COVID uh, school notification, school exposure notification system. Uh, so we'll soon be getting a glimpse of how COVID-19 is moving through Canloop schools. So I'm back from vacation this week and so are the employees over at Senior Froggy's restaurant. Uh, so I spoke with uh, owner Rob Stadola over there and uh, he let me know that everybody's feeling rejuvenated and very happy to have had that paid week off. Uh, looking ahead to the weekend, uh, Kamloopsian Nathaniel Martin is bringing back his cut over 
uh, fundraiser back for its uh, second iteration. He's going to be at Aberdeen Mall between 1 and 4 this Saturday uh, to kick off the fundraiser. It raises funds for the Canadian Mental Health Association and Kamloops Sexual Assault Counseling Center. Uh, and lastly, I'm also working on a story about a new housing development that the Métis uh, Nation BC is building in town. Uh, so that's a little bit about uh, what I've got going on and uh, should be good. Back to you guys in the studio. What did you make of that segment? And Michael's throwback to us was kind of cool too. I thought. Yeah, it was almost, it was almost like a, like he's on he's on the scene. He's back to the studio. It was pretty good. <laughs> he was kind of he was kind of slow and tentative, but yeah. he really got it at the end there. So sort of like when a team's down seventy three nothing, but they score a touchdown at the end. You can get all excited about that. It's pretty good. There's some work to be done there, but mm -hmm. I thought that was great and good. It was a really good, good. job by everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about some of the issues they brought up. Water usage. Uh, what do you yeah. think about that? Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, if you're a stats geek like I am, or you like like data, um, that story was interesting. It, it talked about um, we had uh, you know the hottest, hottest, second hottest summer of all time in Kamloops on record. Records go back to 1891. Uh, we had the hottest temperature ever recorded, uh, June 29th, 47.3 here, and um, and the next day it was 46.4, I think. Uh, we used the most water in one day since 2009, when it was also a very hot day there. And then they talked about how much water was used to fight the fire in Juniper Ridge on Canada Day. And they used the equivalent of 73 days worth of water used in the city, a massive amount of water. Um, and because of all, all, this, all this data and stats, they, uh, they're really looking at uh, further restricting the water restrictions. Right now, I think it's from April 1st to September 30th, uh, water restrictions are in place, so you can only water your lawn, um, your irrigation system uh, on odd number of days, even number yeah. of days, depending on your on your address. The, the idea now is to, when we're in drought conditions or when things are really, really dry, they'll just bring in further restrictions saying you can't water at all. They've done it. I think all, we uh, should uh, consider banning watering lawns. How about What's banning, the point? How about banning lawns, period? Ban lawns. <laughs> It, let's ban lawns. It's all aesthetic. It's, hey, look at me keeping up with the Joneses. Look how green my lawn is. It does look good, though. It costs nice money. Yep. Who, like, it's just a matter of, it's a hey, look at me thing. I'm it in is. my chat group all the time about this, saying, yeah. boys, just stop. It, but all the boys in the chat room, none of them live in a, in a, in a palatial <laughs> penthouse like you do in, in Sahali. They all have yards. You don't have a yard. Yeah. You have a butler who lets I, you in, and, and then, and then doesn't, you don't have to cross the lawn to get into your place. I'd have a rock garden so quick if I had a big house like that. Yeah. These lawns, people should not be watering their lawns, bottom line. It's yeah. just a waste of, look at the environment, like there's gonna be a water war coming up here, no question. We got all the water, the South House is never gonna go dry. We're, we're in a good position for a water well, war. Well, the money then, let's focus on the money. Like you even said in, in Wallace's story that it, this is people watering their lawns. Oh, the, just the, the let, only, let it die. The only, the only money is is if you live up up top right now, if you know you're gonna pump the money up because it costs, takes electricity to pump pump the water up to places. The, 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 the water availability is n not an issue here. We have water, going Going up the yin yang, it's it's getting the water up these steep slopes is the cost. You're right, but there is no water shortage here. It's it's, it's, it's getting the water to places takes money. Yeah. But um, I, I, I'm kind of like I'm kind of half joking and having some fun with it. But no, I, I don't disagree. Think it, I, I saw a study come out that kind of backed up my. Uh, I was playing kind of playing devil's advocate with this mm -hmm. stuff, but. I, I do think there's something there. We shouldn't be watering our lawns that much. It's all. How often do people go out and sit in their lawns and just like hang out on no, the lawns? It, it's all about how it looks. But and I don't disagree with you. You, you. you don't need. I mean, the city has all the great information on the city website, Kamloops.ca, about how you should water. If you have a lawn, you don't have to water it every day. You can water it twice a week. Just water it deep, and at fewer intervals, and it, sa it saves money for the, for you. Because uh, everyone's on a, on a water meter now, so every every ounce of water you use, you pay for now in Kamloops. So. But it does look good. I mean, I, I, I like a, a nice looking lawn in the corner. Yeah. I like I, it. It looks so nice. I like the environment. I like the environment. So, how about as that? He, as, he, as, truck, <laughs> as this belching truck goes up the street after I here. have a Jimmy man. Oh, <laughs> five, well, baby. I think, um, I think you're right. And, and, and on that note, we should remember that grass is just a weed that we accept. It's no different than any other weed, but we seem to like it. I'll put that point in my yep. back pocket. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're running pretty long here, but I do want to touch on Riverside Park. Yes, the, uh, another thing from, uh, from City Hall was that there's this been a push by an, uh, a group called the, I think it's the Camelot's Outdoor Skating Rink Group, uh, Nancy Beppel, James Gordon at True. They're behind it. They wanted 
they want an outdoor skating rink refrigerated, so it's it's it's, it's not affected by the warm you know warm winters. Mm -hmm. uh, and they had uh, the city said it sounds like a good idea. Council is looking at it. You know where the splash park is in Riverside Park that needs to be upgraded anyway. So they're thinking when we upgrade this, let's 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 put in some brine lines and let's let's make it so that in the winter we could just quickly convert it to uh, an ice rink. Uh, no hockey, just playing, playing, you know, going skating, mm. and uh, it would be a, run by a refrigeration unit, so that it's it's going to be a, a, a real professional ice rink. And it was it was it was in the plans, and then the plague came, and money was a worry, and they weren't sure what to do with it. So this week at council, they decided to uh, <clears throat> put that on the back burner for now. They're going to spend money to fix up the spray park for the kids and to replace those cr decrepit old um, uh, washrooms. But they're going to spend a hundred grand to put in brine lines in case they, in the future, they want to put in that rink. And I think it's just a matter of nobody doesn't want it. It's just it's it's your it's your it's your need to have and must to have and like to haves. And right now we're in a situation where the taxes could be significantly higher uh, this coming year, tax hike, mm -hmm. and they want to make sure that they spend the money on essentials right now because we still are in this uh, pandemic. I think it has to get done. Personally, I think it's an embarrassment for the city that the tournament capital, hockey in its blood, doesn't have a refrigerated outdoor rink. Mm -hmm. And every year we go to these outdoor rinks that are good for a couple weeks of the year and then they melt. Yep. This is camels we're talking about. We don't have an outdoor rink. And I think when they do build it, it needs to have hockey. Mm -hmm. That's my big gripe with it too. Yes. I'm a sports guy. No, okay, yeah. I get it. But, but they said no what's hockey. What's the point? And I, I know if you have your family, you want to bring your kids out yep. and you want to skate and you know, hold hands, handshake, first date with your girlfriend. Yep. That's great. Yep. But... You want to be able to wire clap bombs on the rink too. There has to be a way where they can have a schedule, like the pickleball courts I go to, or the um, or the the tennis courts. Sometimes they have lessons. Um, th there has to be a way easy easy enough to say, you know, uh, maybe maybe you know during the weeknights when the kiddies are at home watching uh, the Great Pumpkin with Linus, they can. Uh, they can say that's you know seven to eleven. It's it's adult pickup yeah. hockey, and the rest of the time you can have the kids out there without hockey. Mm -hmm. But that's something that can be sorted out later. Yeah, and I agree with you. We sh I, I think we should have that. But the cost was substantial. So it's it's millions of dollars we're talking about. So they can't afford it right now. I think Kelowna has an outdoor refrigerator rink. And there we go. So they're it's, they're ahead of us again. Yeah, in that, in exactly. That, in that, and that, we, yeah. we we're the just a fly on their shoulder. They don't care about. That's <laughs> and that's why. And uh, well, there's a there's an election exactly twelve uh, twelve months from next next month. So there's an election. There's an issue you can ask your councillors about. It's a shame. It's an embarrassment. And it's right up there with no squash courts. You can't call yourself the tournament capital. Or racquetball courts, courts, which is racquetball a, yeah. or an outdoor refrigerated rink, bottom yeah. line. So maybe Marty will run for council next week and that, that, that'll be his <laughs> next year and that'll be his platform. <laughs> yeah. One thing we talked about at the top of the show was uh, National Truth and Reconciliation Day. And we have been following this story, obviously, in our paper. And we want to uh, show people how they can um, observe the day. Yes, uh, it's September 30th is the first annual national day for truth and reconciliation on the front page of the september 29th camlips this week newspaper there's a story there's a haunting photo of the uh, camlips indian residential school building bathed in orange taken by ali d our photographer back in uh, may 30th and um, that story has ha tells you all about why there's this day and what you can do uh, as a resident of camlips to to mark and honor that day a lot of this all the stuff is online because of the pandemic but if you go to uh, to camloops.ca and uh, type in your search engine uh, to come loose to Sequamic um, uh, First Nation. You'll come to the website and they'll have everything on there you need to know about how you can get involved, how you can, how you can watch, take part in the, in, the, in the worldwide drumming circle at 2.15 p.m. on September 30th. Mm -hmm. Also, there's I, other ideas, Orange Shirt Day. It's, it's, September 30th is also Orange Shirt Day, which uh, orange is, is the color of reconciliation because of Phyllis Webstad, the, uh, the, the, the famous story about the young girl who went to Williams Lake Residential School when she was six and they took away her, her favorite orange shirt her, I think her grandmother gave her. And that became a symbol, a symbol for reconciliation. So you can wear orange tomorrow. You can go on to the Tacoma Loops website. Uh, and you can, and, and, and what, like Mayor Christian said, in, 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 and, uh, and I think uh, Chief Roseanne Casimir has also said before, it can be something as simple like on Remembrance Day where you just take some time and reflect on what that might mean to you and maybe what you can do to help further the cause. So it's basically a day just to think about Think about the issues. Join us on September the 30th at 2.15 p.m. Pacific to drum for the children. On this very first Canadian National Day of Truth and Reconciliation, I invite the world to gather safely to drum and sing for the missing children of Indian residential schools. It's time to honour the children 
and the unrelenting spirit of these ancestors. It's time to drum for the healing of the Indian residential school survivors who carried the burden of knowing where the children were buried. To drum for the healing of the families and the communities whose children did not come home. Help us shine a light on truth, the pursuit of justice and peace, and healing for all affected by these beloved missing children. At Schwatmuch, the drum is central to our cultural expression and ceremonies. We offer comfort and peace to our loved ones at gatherings when we lift our voices and drumsticks to sing our songs. Join us. We invite you to learn the Schwatmuk Honor Song so that we may sing and drum in unity at 2.15 p.m. Pacific on September the 30th. Make a plan to gather safely on September 30th. Take time to connect with others to learn the Schwatmuk Honor Song. Be heard, be seen on behalf of the children and be sure to share with us how you will participate. It's time to drum for the children. Again, you can read more about the day in our newspaper and uh, online. I think that's it for the show today. Mm -hmm. Any final thoughts on the show? No, I think I like that we, uh, it went long, but I like that we talked about, um, uh, introduced our, our, some of our reporters. We'll, we'll try to keep doing that each week. Uh, you know, get Dave Eagles in there and maybe even have you do something to say what you're working on or we could talk about it here. Um, and um, and I like the fact that we're... we're um, maybe uh, Tim Schultz, the, the operations Tim Schultz, manager. maybe we can get uh, Ray Jolliker, the sales manager, and uh, Sexy Chris uh, Wilson, the, um, <laughs> the digital sales manager, because they're doing a bunch of stuff. In fact, the sales, the digital, digital sales team just created this incredible... Um, campaign. I know it's advertising and everything, but it's uh, maybe we can link to it next week or something. It's a really cool thing they've done, and it shows you what the digital team does behind the scenes for uh, for clients to make their online presence um, kind of pop. Last word to Herman again: October thirtieth in Merritt Apple Fest Purity Feed. 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. They're bringing the commercial juicer in there. You can see how it's made. You can buy your juice. And uh, actually, one more thing. Thanks to Scott Finley and the Grand Ones again for the music. I don't say that enough. Lee Malbuff for the uh, logos that he does. And we'll see you last week. Last week.